Hey, I want to talk to you today about facing giants. We all face giants. Anybody ever faced a giant? Anybody facing a battle, a giant right now in your life? Anybody facing something? Just want to give it to God right now by signifying to him that we all face some giants. And if you are under the impression, by the way, that following after Jesus makes it where you won't face any giants, let me remind you of something. The scripture does not say no weapon will be formed against you. The scripture actually says that no weapon will be formed against you that will prosper. So the weapon might be formed, but it won't prosper. How many people want to give God a hand for how many times Satan has tried to come against you, but he came and didn't allow it to prosper? And so there's weapons out there, and I can think of times in my life where I have faced giants, where I have faced the battle, and God has been so good to me. And why is that? Because it does not always happen like we want but it always ends up like God purposed it. Anybody remember that from last week? We said it's, it's how God purposed it. He is always going to have his way. And when we find a giant coming into our lives, or if we find a giant coming into our homes, or even more dangerous like we talked about last weekend, if we find a giant coming into our minds, we feel the weight of the enormity of facing these giants. If you've lived long enough to face a giant, you know that sometimes when you size up the battle, when you size up the giant in your life, you can face the weight of it and the enormity. So I don't know what your giant is that you are facing today. Like, I'll give you a few just to get your mind working. Maybe it's a situation at work. Maybe there's something that you're facing at work that is a giant, a battle in your life. Maybe it's caring for an aging parent. So many people going through that right now, especially during this time where it is so um, unusual of a time to even be caring for a parent. How about financial giants that we might be facing or relationship challenges or depression or anxiety or for many of us, it's challenges in our bodies and we're going, this is a giant I've never faced before. I don't know how to face it. Well, one of the most famous stories in the Bible is a story of overcoming a giant. You probably have heard this story. We call it the story of David and Goliath. And we find the story in 1 Samuel chapter 17. I want you to go there with me to verse 3, if you would. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 3. It says, so the Philistines and the Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with the valley between them. The valley. Everybody say valley. valley. Giants work most effectively in valleys. In a valley is when a giant is going to put up the greatest fight. We're going to see that in this story. But we've seen that in our own lives as well. The enemy of our soul knows when we are down, when we are tired, when we have given all that we've gotten, when we are tired of it, when we can't take anymore, he knows when we are in a valley. The enemy of our soul knows that, so be alert, be on the watch, and here comes the giant. Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Goth, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. What makes the valley so intimidating is not the valley itself. We've all been through a valley. Many of you are going through valleys. We'll, we'll, we'll find you in valleys when we're doing counseling with you. We'll find out that you're going through something that's a valley. It's something that other people have gone through. We all go through valleys. We all go through times where we're tired, where we're sick, where things just aren't working out the way that we would want them to, where people or other circumstances affect our lives in some ways. So we all go through the valley. But it's not the valley itself that is intimidating. It is the presence of a giant in the valley that is intimidating. But I want to remind you that God speaks to us about valleys. He did it in Psalm chapter 23, verse 4. Look at Psalm 23, verse 4 real quick. I'll just jumping over from 1 Samuel says this. Even though I walk through the valley, everybody say valley again, of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. There are a few words that stand out to me what we learn from God about valleys. The first word is walk. Though I walk through these valleys, the scripture says, and that reminds me that it will never be as fast getting through the valley as I want it to be. 
Anybody ever gone through something that they didn't want to go through that lasted longer than you wanted it to go? Maybe if it lasted more than one second, right? Because we don't like discomfort. Well, I don't like discomfort. I don't like pain. I don't like anything about what's going on right now in our pandemic that's happening in our world. I want to run through the valley. But the scripture says, do I walk through the valley? The second word I love, though, that I pointed out or that stood out to me is the word through. But I will, I will, get, I will walk through through the valley. I will get through. Everybody shout it with your best shout. Shout through. We need to remember that this too shall pass. I will get through the valley. Every valley I've ever walked through, I've gotten through. And even the valleys that people have walked through that ended in their death, if they knew Jesus, guess what? They got through it because they went to see Jesus in that very moment. I get through things. I don't stay in things, the scripture tells me. So this shows me that God's intentions are always that I get through. And then look what he says. I walk through what? The shadow of, the, the shadow of death. What we experience in these valleys is but the shadow of death. Because Jesus defeated the substance of death when he was on the cross. So no matter what I'm going through, I can know that it's but a shadow as a Christ follower. No matter how much pain it is, I can know it's really just a shadow of real pain. I'm not just, dis, dis, uh, you know, uh, I can't think of the word. I'm not, I'm not trying to get rid of pain in your life. I go through pain as well. But I can remember, I can put it in my thoughts. This, this feels real, but Jesus already defeated this on the cross. This is just a shadow of what death could really feel like. It also takes us back to the cross to remind us if we're experiencing a shadow of death, and Jesus experienced real death, what he really went through for us, how much he really loves us, the shadow of death. And then it says this, I will fear no evil. When I read this about my valleys, I am reminded, this is interesting, I will fear no evil, that there actually will be evil. Because if Jesus is telling me, don't fear evil, he's also pointing out to me that there's going to be an actual intimate encounter with evil. That I'm actually going to have moments in my life where when I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, that I don't have to fear evil because he's already conquered death, but there is a real evil that is after me. There's a real evil who wants to destroy me. There's a real evil that wants to destroy you. But in the, I love this the most. At the end of this, it says this, and why can I fear no evil? Why, why is it that I don't have to give in to that temptation to live my life in fear? Because he says, I will comfort you. He will comfort me, the psalmist said. I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death because he will comfort me. Comfort me. Comfort me. So we find the people of God then in a valley. And God knows a little bit about valleys. He speaks to us about valleys. And we know that the giant taunts us in a valley. And we find them there with a champion on the other side taunting them and calling them into battle. It says this about him. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. He wore armor that weighed 125 pounds. This was a huge man. In his book, David and Goliath, Malcolm Gladwell articulates a few realities about the story of David. One of them I found very interesting. First, he says, Goliath probably suffered from acromegule, which is a disease. Do you remember Andre the Giant? Anybody remember Andre the Giant? Andre the Giant probably would have been one of the worst wrestlers in the world if it weren't fake. Why? Because if you have acromegule, you actually move very slow. Remember Andre the Giant? Remember when he said, I will squash you, you know, that kind of stuff. And he was very slow, very, very sluggish. He'd move his feet because your bones continue to grow even when they shouldn't. Your body continues to grow when it should have stopped growing. It's a disease that makes you shuffle your feet. You can't see well. That's why in the scripture it tells us that Goliath had a, a, a bearer who would go in front of him, a shield bearer who would kind of walk the way for him because he probably couldn't see well. And so we had these things going for him. But what we know about acromegule as well is that it makes you a giant. You're huge. You're massive. And so what they can see is this massive, massive man. But what we see about this giant in the valley 
We have to take note of that because what we see is all about external intimidation. How many times have you had something in your life that you're like, man, it's so intimidating because you don't feel like you can stand up against it. You don't feel like there's any way. It's so much larger than you. So much, the circumstances that you're looking at, you're going, they're so much bigger than me. It's in, it's in external intimidation. Chapter, or verse 8. But Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across the Israelite, to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight, he called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you are our slaves. Can I remind you of something about the giants that you're facing in your life? Whatever that giant is, whatever that big battle in front of you is, no, no matter how small it seems to you right now in this moment, as you might would compare it to other giants, it's still a giant to you. When you look at it, you're still intimidated by it. Let me remind you of the goal of every single giant, to make you a slave. That's every giant. That's what, what does Goliath say? I, I, if, if we win, and he's very confident of being able to win, we're going to make you a slave. What the enemy of your soul wants is for you to be a slave to fear, a slave to your addiction, a slave to your anger, a, a slave to any sin that you can think of that you struggle with or any circumstance that would bring about sin in you. What the enemy wants is for you to be a slave. Verse 10, I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. And when Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. These men were intimidated by the external factors that they are seeing of this nine-foot-tall man wearing 125-pound armor. They were afraid. Why couldn't God work through these men in this moment? You know, I think sometimes when we read the scriptures, we quickly put ourselves into the role of those who win, and we quickly size up who the weak people are, and we start to look down on them. And so we watch Peter start to sink, and we go, oh, I don't want to be like Peter, but actually, I want to be like Peter, because Peter was the only one in the boat who was willing to what? Walk on water. I mean, he got to walk on water. I know he only took two steps and then he fell, but we look at Peter and go, oh, we don't want to be like Peter. Actually, let's be more like Peter. Let's be more like Peter. We look at this story and we look at these men and we go, man, why didn't they stand up? Why didn't they fight Goliath? God was ready. But I, I think that we put ourselves into the story and we make ourselves soon to be hero that we're going to meet in just a moment, David, don't we? We're like, we're like David. I mean, we're the David in this story. And what I really think is true as we're studying this story that we need to remember is we're not David in this story. We are Saul's men. And what I mean by that is we are the ones, I am the one, I can just be honest, who's sitting back looking at my battle, sitting back looking at the giant in front of me and cowering in fear. I'm the one who is led by fear so often. I am the one who is taken back by my anxiety so often. I am the one who fears the future, regrets the past, and doesn't live in the moment so often. But I have to cut them some slack for just a little bit. They were looking at a nine-foot-tall man who was armored up, who was their champion, and all of them are looking around at each other going, so who's going to go first? I mean, who wants to be the, we'll see how tough he is. Maybe he moves slow. Maybe he's got a weak point. Maybe he can't see. They didn't know that, but maybe that was what they'd find out. But they're thinking, who's going to be first? And they're scared, and they're intimidated, and they're frightened. And I think that your giant makes you terrified and deeply shaken. And I want to just tell you, if you're not so quick to put yourself into the story as David, if you'll let yourself allow yourself to be in the real place where you really are, which is Saul's men for just a moment, that you'll begin to feel for yourself just a little bit, and that's okay. You'll begin to go, yeah, there's really a giant in front of me, and I need, I need an answer, and I'm not the answer, and I'm afraid, and I'm cowering, and I don't know how to tackle this, and I don't know how to fight this, and I've tried before, but I've lost, and I've seen others 
go down who tried to fight this. And so we put ourselves there in the story. But then the story takes a quick turn over about 10 miles east to Bethlehem to a man named Jesse's home where we find our hero of the story, David. In 14, verse 14 tells us David was the youngest son. The Bible tells us this to remind us that he had never seen battle. In verses 17 through 23, it tells us that David is just the water boy to take some food and water to his brothers and to the other men who are actually in the battle and fighting. And then what he finds when he shows up is the Goliath, this huge giant of a man, is taunting the Israelites and he's taunting their God. Verse 24 we skip to says, as soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Have you seen the giant? The men asked David. This, this jumped out at me. <clears throat> Have you seen the giant? Have you seen the giant? They're concentrating what? On the external intimidation. Have you seen what I see? Have you seen what I have to battle? And concentrating on the size and magnitude of our problems will always result in fear. Always. What did we talk about last week? We have to remap and retrain our minds. And when we concentrate on the size and magnitude of our problems and that they are greater than we are, oftentimes our problems are, by the way, truly greater than we are. And if we concentrate on the size and magnitude of our problems, it will always result in fear. In fact, I would say this. When you find yourself living in fear, and how many times do we do that even as Christ followers? Living in fear. You can go, all right, I must be concentrating on the size and the magnitude of my problem. It's a way to reverse engineer and know what you got to work on. But David has some dialogue with the men and his brothers. His brothers talk some smack to him, and they're like, what are you even doing here, water boy? Come on, just go back home to mama, all that kind of stuff. They talk smack just like older brothers do to their younger brothers. The Bible's so real, y'all. If you read that, you're like, oh, I can see my older brother talking exactly like that to me. So they do that. And then on the field, they let him know in uns no uncertain times, no uncertain terms, rather, that he is not worthy of this fight. But he is not convinced. Look at what David says in verse 32. He says, don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. I will go and fight this Philistine, David says. Um, what David saw is that all giants seem larger than they really are. But how did David see that? How did David see that? He saw it. I, because of confidence, confidence. I love this kind of confidence. I was talking with my son Sam just a little while ago, wasn't that long ago at all. He, he's nine years old and we were sitting down and we were having like one of those kind of real conversations that you have where you realize they're really starting to talk to you about things that they, they think about and worry about and all that kind of stuff, you know, and we were sitting there talking and we got on the subject of his career aspirations. I know, nine-year-old career aspirations, right? But for him, it was really real. And so we were talking about it and talking about his career aspirations and what he wanted to do. And he told me, he said, Dad, I think I've narrowed it down what I want to do when I grow up. He said, the problem is I have two things. And I could tell that he was really torn, like, between these two things. You could just tell by the way he was talking to him. He said, first off, I know that I want to preach at Freedom Church. He's like, that's what I, one of the things I want to do. And I was like, that's right. Come on, son. Following dad's steps. We'll preach you up. That's what we'll do. He's like, but I got a problem. Because my second job that I know I'm going to do is that I want to be the quarterback for the New England Patriots. <laughs> and honestly, I think he may have done better than Cam this year had he tried. But that's just a whole other subject. But so he says, and here's my problem. I can't figure out how I'm going to make the late games on Sundays if I'm preaching, how will I get to those, I mean, the early games, how will I get, he said, I'm fine with the late games. I can get there for those 4 o'clock games. 
but I don't know how I'm going to get to the game, those one o'clock games. How am I going to do that? And he's torn about it. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching this. And his biggest concern is how he's going to get a private jet to get him from Freedom Church to, to New England or wherever they're playing, Foxborough, wherever they're playing that week by 4 o'clock. He's got zero lack of confidence for the fact that he could quarterback the New England Patriots. So finally, he says, you know, Dad, I think what I'll do is I'll just preach at Freedom Church, and I'll just play football in college because that plays on Saturdays, and there won't be any problem. Boom. Solved, right? Solved. And I'm thinking, I like, I love this confidence. I love the fact that he is like nine years old, weighs a max of 38 pounds. Okay, I mean, like, and he is like, I got this. I am in charge of my own destiny. And David says, I got this. I got confidence. David shows us the same level of confidence. But can I ask you, can we have that level of confidence? We'll, we'll see in the story in just a moment. Saul says, don't be ridiculous. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. Saul essentially is having a conversation back to David that I wouldn't have with my son at nine to go, hey, I don't, I don't know that the NFL is kind of like in your genes. You know, they always tell you, look at your mom, look at your dad. They'll tell you a lot about what you're going to end up about. Do I look like an NFL quarterback to you? I know slightly. I know just a little bit. But I mean, I'm just saying, do I, I don't think, so I'm looking at Sam. I could say, hey, that's not going to be your thing. I didn't have the conversation with him about, hey, here's the deal. I, I want you to preach. That would be awesome if you preach. But I know you want what I have, but are you willing to go through what I went through to get what I have? You know, I, I, didn't have that. I didn't have that conversation. When people want what you have, you always need to ask them, I know you want to be who I am, but do you want to be who I was? Wow. How I had to walk through that. I didn't have that conversation with him that day because he's nine, and that would be cruel. At nine, you go... We got this, buddy. I'll be, he said, will you be at my games on Sunday? I said, I'll be at every single game that you play in the NFL, buddy. Every single one of them. Because I will be. And that will be none. And so I didn't tell him that, though. Why? Because here's the deal. You don't, you don't want to crush their confidence. But Saul says, I got to be real with David. And he has that talk with him. He's like, you're not going to win this, David. You're not going to do it. It's, it's easy, though. Again, to read scripture with our hindsight and, and, and not give some street cred to who we know the villain in the story actually turns out to be Saul, though he was anointed king by God, ends up being a bit of a villain in David's story and in the story of God. And so we read the scripture and we're like, well, we know Saul is the villain, so I'm not going to give him any street cred. I'm going to be mad at Saul because he's not letting the man of God do the man of God's job. And David, the man of God, needs to go fight. But here's what you need to know. David was not a man of God yet because David was but a boy. He was 12 to 15 years old at the time. Can you imagine a 12-year-old, 13, 14, 15-year-old, whatever it may have been, coming up? To the king and saying, I will go fight the nine foot tall monster of a man that is over there. Can you, can you imagine like, what it would feel like, what it would be like to fight this man? And, and Saul, let's give him some credit. He's got a good point. He's like, you're not ready for this. You're just a boy. And you're in a big boy league right now, man. You're, you're wanting to go fight this giant. But David persisted. He said, I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. Okay, David. <laughs> There's a nine-foot-tall giant over there, but you've been taking care of the sheep and goats. Okay, Saul's saying. But then he says, he breaks it down just a little bit more. He says, when a lion or a bear, okay, now we're getting real, comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and I club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Saul's like, dang. 
You grabbed him by the, the jaw? Yeah. When you grabbed him by the jaw, would you, I beat him with a club. He's like, man, you got some credit too, bro. That's pretty good. Here's what I say about David. Never forget your own lion and bear stories. When you're facing your giant and he looks nine foot tall, don't forget what God already took you through. Don't, don't forget what God has already done for you. Don't forget how he's already worked in you, how he's already prepared you for the battle, that the last giant you faced may have only been seven foot tall, but that was to give you the confidence that you could pay, face one that was nine foot tall. Don't forget your lion and bear stories. In fact, what if we were to partner with Holy Spirit? What if we were to allow Holy Spirit to remind us and show us what he's done in us and through us. What if, when we were, what if when we faced our giant, the first thing we did is say, God, bring it back. Bring it back. Let me remember how I prayed and you came and you answered. God, let me remember how I got, I got, I got so afraid and I thought I wasn't going to make it and I thought I couldn't face it. And, and I thought there was no way I could, could even walk this mile with you, God. That you came through and you carried me and you made it with me and you did everything I need. What, what if we could remember our own lion and bear stories. Not how just God worked through us, or in us rather, but how he worked through us. Remembering how we got through this before. But ultimately, let me show you though, how giants fall. So that's a series we're in right now. Giants fall. The good news, I'll spoiler alert it for you, is the giants, when you follow God, fall. The Lord, David says, who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from the Philistine. This is a wonderful way to deal with giants. I want you to see where his eyes are. They're not on the magnitude and the weight of the giant. He says, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear. The, law, the, the Lord is who I'm looking for. David is like, you know what, to think of it, I didn't have the strength to beat the lion. I didn't have the strength to beat the bear. It's my lion and it's my bear story, but really it's a story of the Lord. And that's who I'm going to keep my eyes on because I had the strength of the Lord. How many of you would say, I have been through some stuff, but the only reason I made it is God was with me. And if God is for me, who can be against me? And what can stand against me? Shall calamity and trial come against me? Absolutely not. Because God's for me. And David says, if I got God, I'm all right. So the scripture tells us that Saul consented. He's finally like, all right, go ahead and may the Lord be with you, Saul says. That's, that's basically Bible speak for me. The odds be ever in your favor. Like, Saul's like, all right, whatever, man. You're not even my kid anyway. I don't care. Go. Go. What are you going to do? Go. If he gets killed, we got plenty more men. So Saul sends him out. Verse 38. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet, and a coat of mail. And David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things. Remember, he's 12 to 15 years old. He's putting on a grown man's armor. And then David says, I can't go in these. He protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off. I don't have time to preach this, but I want you to write it down. I want you to remember it. Don't try and fight your battles in someone else's armor. You, you, you're, if it's your battle to fight, God will equip you to fight it. If you need to walk in somebody else's armor to fight it, maybe it's not your battle to fight. Maybe it's not your giant to face. And so David goes, look here, I got to be me. And so he takes off the armor. Then he goes and he picks up five smooth stones from a stream in the valley. God may give you just what you need while you're in the valley to be able to fight your giant. And so he picks up the stones and he puts them into his little shepherd's bag, his little fanny pack. And then armed only with a shepherd's staff and a sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Picture this scrawny kid walking across the valley with a staff, a stick, a rod, and a sling. Wait. It was David who wrote Psalm 23 that we read earlier. 
What did he say? I walk, though I walk through the valley. You think that when David was writing this decades later, he might have been remembering his lion and bear story? When I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, can you imagine the shadow of this nine foot giant falling across the valley? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because I'm remembering something. I had a staff. And I had a rod, your rod and your staff, it will comfort me, David says. He's remembering, and he goes, it wasn't the fact that I had a weapon, it was you that had a weapon. I was armed with a rod and a sling and some stones, but it wasn't you, me, God, it was you. They weren't my weapons, they were God's weapons. But David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, spirit, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, who have defi- you have defied. But look at verse 46. I love this. I want you to remember this. I want you to put this over your life with every giant that you face in the future. If you've never seen this in the Bible today, I want you to let this be a thought that is mapped into your brain. Look at what he says. Today, the Lord will conquer you. And I will kill you and cut off your head. I used to talk smack. I still talk smack when I play basketball. I love to talk trash when I play basketball. I'm a pretty good basketball player. It's the one sport I could ever play. I'll face any of you. If you think I'm not, just challenge me. Come on. And, And so I would talk a lot of trash, a lot of trash. I never talk this kind of trash. Today, the Lord will conquer you. And I will defeat you and I will cut off your head. But I love, let's look at what it says. The Lord will conquer you. And that's what we've been talking about, right? This is the Lord's battle. <clears throat> but David shows us that if we follow after Jesus, we get to be a part of the actual plan and a part of his plan of conquering. He says, the, in other words, just because it's worship does not mean it won't take work. I'm going to be a part of this, David says. The Lord is the one who's going to conquer you, but I get a chance to kill you and be a part of the plan, and I'm going to be the one who cuts off your head, David says. And so when you look at your giant, it is going to be God who conquers the giant, but you're going to get a chance to worship through the worry. It's going to be God who will conquer the giant, but you're going to get to praise during the pain and get peace. It is, it is going to be by his might, but it's going to be my delight to be able to beat the giant. Yeah. Earlier in the story, we didn't read this part, but Saul says, whoever can kill this giant, and he names all this stuff that they'll get. They'll get money, they'll get prizes, they'll get, it's like they won the lottery. What is it now, like half a billion dollars or something? It's like they won the lottery, and David is like, you know what? You can't win the lottery if you don't play the lottery. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going in. And he gets the spoil of the win, but he also gets a chance to take delight in the fact that he is going to be a part of God's plan. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him, reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone He hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. The giant is dead. The giant falls. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran over, stood over him. He took a hold of the Philistine sword. He uses his own weapon against him. I'll tell you what, every time God wins a battle in your life, he turns it on the enemy of your soul, Satan, and he uses it against him to show him you are stronger and you are better than they ever thought that you were. You made it through one battle, one valley, you can make it through another one. He drew it from his sheath, and after he killed him, he cut off his head with a sword. Let me show you something in verse 54 that I just love. And David took the Philistine's head to Jerusalem. What a a sight, right? 
walking into Jerusalem. They were singing songs to him. He took it to Jerusalem to celebrate. He said, I got the giant's head in my hand. But he stored the man's armor in his own tent, in his own house. That was his house. He stored the man's armor in his own place. Following every victory, place a trophy in your mind, in your tent, to remind you that the battle is the Lord's. Every time David would look at that 125-pound armor, he would go, that was a big man. How did they know it was 125 pounds? Because they got to measure it. They got to weigh it. Because David owned it. Because David possessed it. He said, I know now. I don't have to guess and worry about how big my giant was. I know because I defeated them and I carried his head. I know how big he was. And so David says, I'll keep it in my tent to remind me of the battle that I can win. Here, here's, here's my final thought. Everyone else focused on the size of the giant. But David focused on the size of his God. And here's the twist in the story. You're not David. I'm not David. Jesus is David. We are Saul's men, and we need a champion. We can't face the battle. It is too big for us. We can't possibly go down that road. We can't possibly do what we need to do. But we have a champion. His name is Jesus. We can cower in fear for just a moment, and then we can go, but wait a minute, David is coming, and it will be his delight to fight my battles with me. David has come, and he has been on a cross, and he has saved me. And so am I more focused on my giant, or am I more focused on my Savior? Am I more focused on what's against me, or am I more focused on who's for me? Because I have a champion. He is my champion. So whatever you're facing today, here's what I want you to gather on how giants fall. They fall at the foot of the cross. They fall not because we're big enough to be David's. They fall because we're wise enough to follow after a Savior named Jesus. And there may be a champion, a supposed champion on the other side, taunting at you, saying, I've conquered you before. I've fought and beaten you before. I've done everything that I need to do to you before. And in those moments, that's when we can say, you are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you won.